For the first time, it's the World Cup Final Word Daily 2023. Adam Collins and Jeff Lemon brought to you by Westfield. More extra, less ordinary. That was certainly the tenor of New Zealand's performance. Unbelievable. Jeff, tell us about it in 30 seconds. It looked like it would be same old England best. Clips the second ball of the match for six. They'll just keep doing what they're doing. But no, every time a partnership forms New Zealand, nip it in the bud. Matt Henry is important. Mitchell Santon is important. And yes, every England player makes double figures. That's never happened in a one-day international in history but they don't get the big partnership they don't explode 282 for nine is what they end up with it looks pretty good when there's an early wicket will young out first ball and then that's the only wicket ravindra conway they just both blaze to hundreds they mow down the target with absolutely miles of overs to spare um, and they have pummeled england in the opening match of the world cup it feels like such a defining night at Ahmedabad. So New Zealand get the job done. They chase down 283 in 30, inside 37 overs. Conway, 152 not from 121 deliveries. Ravindra, his first international 100. What a time for it. 123 not out from just 96 balls, including five sixes. One massive six over mid-wicket when he was getting moving through the, the power play when the field was in. A visionary call from New Zealand to use him at number three. We spoke about it on the, on the previous show a couple of days ago that... In the absence of Kane Williamson, they had to make a bit of a strategic call there. But this reminds me a lot of what Australia did against Pakistan 20 years ago in their World Cup opener. Shane Warne suspended on the cusp of the tournament. They had to make a big structural decision and went with Andrew Simons, who made 143 not out uh, on that day in South Africa. Well, it's Ravindra here. They only had 12 fit men to pick from. I mean, it sounds like from Ravindra in the post-game interviews that had Ferguson been fit, he may not have even played today, but he's taken that opportunity, made the most of it. We got a little bit of a glimpse at Lords in the in the final one day or a couple of weeks ago that he's able to hit bombs. Well, the way he did it with such regularity tonight, clinical as well, a couple of those square drives were to die for, and doing it with Conway, who we know is a master in a chasing situation. I think... It was all about the confidence with Ravindra. He came in with that swagger of a young player who was like, OK, what's the big deal? Yeah, sure, I've, you know, people have heard of these guys who are bowling at me, but whatevs, I'll just start popping him over the fence, which was mm. crucial at that point because Will Young was out first ball he faced, first ball that Sam Curran bowled. Like, yeah, sure, Conway drives a couple through the covers off Wokes in the first over. Um, and then Young's out, they're... they're 10 runs on the board, first wicket down. Curran bowls another maiden after that. He's, he's bowled two back-to-back -back with a wicket. It's starting to feel a bit sticky and, and a bit tricky. And then Ravindra just says, oh, what's the big deal? I'll just get going with a, a beautifully driven uh, mid-on drive that goes wide and mid-on and races away to the boundary. A couple of balls later, Wokes drops a little short, not even that short, like hip-high short. Bang, cross bat mm. shot, smack that over the leg side. And England are like, well, haha, -ha, we've got a, uh, an ace up our sleeve. It's Mark Wood. He's very fast and scary. And Ravindra's like, cool. That just means the ball will go further when I hook it and starts popping him over the fence. It was like the, 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 the devil may care sort of approach of it was extraordinary, but he wasn't slogging. He was nailing everything out of the middle. And they go from the first three or four overs looking pretty dicey to scoring 81 off the first 10. They got 81 in the power play. And I reckon England had lost the game by that point. They looked absolutely rocked by what had happened there. Yeah, they scored 94 runs between overs 4 and 14 in the chase. And just to go back to New Zealand's fielding innings, like they held their nerve well. Besser hits that six, they can see 12 runs in the first over. But straight away, set and forget, Matt Henry Maiden. And I know it sounds like a a small thing in the context mm -hmm. of a 50-over of a international, but just not letting England completely get away from them early on. And as Owen Morgan was discussing on the, on the TV coverage on Sky, but this is the, the, the change that England have made, right? They've, they've elected to go with Dava Milan to open with Johnny Bairstow. They're, they're not having two blokes who mm -hmm. are going to try and hit the cover off it from ball one. They're, they're going a slightly different way here. Like there was that front cover of the Wisdom Cricket Monthly that we spoke about um, a couple of weeks ago, which... Um, you know, said it's the last dance for this group of older English players. I'm not saying that's the wrong call, backing many players that have won two World Cups, but it does feel different to 2019 where, for whatever reason, it felt like they could do anything, mm. whereas now um, they are the hunted and they've been, they've been taken down spectacularly tonight by New Zealand, who, you know, it's, this feels like 2019 as well. They came into that tournament absolutely nowhere. No one backed them to make the semi-final of the competition four years ago. Well, they come as close mm. as they can 
to winning the whole thing. They just have this group of players they trust in any circumstance. And um, and like bowlers like Bolt and Henry and so on had to do so much heavy lifting. They were used well by the stand-in captain Latham, who, who, who placed their overs at the right time of the innings, got breakthroughs when they desperately needed them. Mm-hmm. And we haven't even mentioned Mitchell Sartner yet, who picked up two for 30 and didn't concede a boundary in his entire set of 10. Well, it, it was the situation New Zealand were in was they had three bowlers, three specialist bowlers. So they had to get 20 overs out of Nisham, Ravindra and Glenn Phillips, uh, the latter two bowling part-time spin. They got the full 10 out of Ravindra in the end. So he got pummeled in his first over, went for a couple of fours and a six and then picked up a wicket, dragged down Harry Brooks, smacks it out to deep mid-wicket on 25. But a couple have already gone by that point because Dava Milan has gone fishing uh, and nicked Henry behind. And then Bairstow's looking great on 33, chips Santner out to deep cover and, and gets caught really good tumbling catch out there. Um, just sort of tempted him by throwing it a bit wider and a bit slower and, and best they went after it. But it felt like to me that England never fully dropped the hammer, right? And this is the team that has made an art form of dropping the hammer and keeping it dropped at all times. Um, Joe Root said afterwards that you you can be a little bit cagey in the first match, like they were trying to feel out what was an okay score and all the rest of it. But aside from when Butler came in um, and rattled off 60 with Root in quick time in that partnership, Butler was the one who was looking to clear the fence early um, and who was going up well above a strike rate of 100 um, through the early part of his innings. But but that, was, that felt like the only point where England were really pushing. And then after that, it was Root batting beautifully just to, to, to tick the ball around. But he wanted someone to go at the other end and nobody was quite able to flick that switch. Yeah, wickets at really important times. Just to go through the figures. So Henry, three for 48, Bolt, one for 48. Uh, so th- they, they've played an important role with Sartner, two for 37. But, you know, no England player hit more than five boundaries. We've got... Um, you know, Root hitting four fours and a six, Brook likewise, Bairstow likewise, but none of them were able to put, you know, ongoing pressure uh, on the New Zealand fielders. We're going to hear a lot in the post-match wash-up about the benefits of batting second, and I think that's noteworthy. We saw that in the T20 World Cup in the UAE almost exactly two years ago, Jeff, that fielding first um, was a, a huge correlation between winning, mm. um, and New Zealand had the, the benefit of the coin falling their way today. Butler said... He would have batted second had he won the toss as well. So uh, it's a sample size of one game, but there was a lot of dew out there. You could see with Mo and Ali bowling towards the end, the ball Mm -hmm. was drenched. So, you know, bowling first is going to be a big part of, you know, there's that thing of how much is a toss worth and there's that... um, that theory that, that two captains should put in an envelope what they feel like the toss should be worth mm. by way of runs before a match and that should dictate who wins it, you know, outlandish and eccentric as that is. But, you know, I reckon if the, the two captains were standing there today, they would have had a pretty high number on their in their envelope mm. on, on account of the fact that they would have known that it was going to get very dewy and thus get very hard to, to field later on. Yeah, the flip side being that it's bloody hot out there when you're fielding, so you've got all 11 of your team out in the heat rather than two, two of them at a time. Um, Tom Latham's captaincy today, spot on, I thought. that The point where Butler and Root are going really nicely and, and they're damaging his, his part-time bowlers and he goes, OK, um, we need to change this up, brings Henry back on. He brings the deep third up and so he gets Butler looking to play that little dab shot and that's when Butler edges Henry behind, little bit of width, um, just draws him into playing that stroke and nicks that through to the keeper. Um, and then as you're sort of getting into the late 30s and, and into the the early 40s in terms of overs, goes back to spin. I mean, Ravindra's been uh, punched around a bit earlier, but goes back to him. He bowls a really good over that concedes only five, brings Phillips back on. He gets root out, um, bowls. Yeah. Basically, Yorks him, um, which you're not expecting from an off spinner first ball. Um, bowls in at middle and off, really full roots already. He's premeditated the reverse, so he plays over the top of it. Gets bowled for 77, that's crucial. Um, and then goes, finishes out Ravindra's 10, brings back Santner for an over. He picks up a wicket as well. I think it was Wokes that, that Santner picked up there. And suddenly he can go back to his main bowlers, to, to Henry and Bolt. Um, knowing that, that they'll be able to see out most of the rest of the innings. I thought it was a, a masterclass of uh, bowling changes and, and field placements from Latham. Yeah, I agree with you. And look, Ravindra isn't much of a bowler, right? Like, we can be honest. He's a fabulous batter, but he's not much of a bowler. Burgling that wicket of Brook felt really important. Mm. They just couldn't build those partnerships they needed with the exception of Root and Butler. But Phillips hitting the stumps twice in, in his first two overs, right? He's a very useful cricketer, Glenn Phillips. Not needed with the bat tonight, nor was Daryl Mitchell. But we'll see a lot of Phillips, I think, playing almost as the second spinner until they can balance it up with Sodi, likely coming into the 11 mm. at some stage. He was the only 
fit New Zealand squad member who didn't play tonight with Southie also injured. And of course, Williamson and Ferguson with that niggle that we've already mentioned. So yeah, that they were able to, uh, you know, use those part-time as well at good times. And now there'll be the recrim- recriminations with England, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, with world champion sides and premiership sides in other codes, there, there tends to be one defining moment when they're over the hill, right? When it's all over and often yep. um, that can be seen in a global tournament. And with England, um, maybe we've seen it. Maybe this is the moment. I'm not saying that they haven't got the, the, the cattle to uh, regroup and go again and, and we'll talk about what they have ahead at the end of the show. But um, And they, of course, they lost three games in the previous World Cup and looked gone after losing to Sri Lanka and Australia in consecutive games four years ago. But yeah, this does feel different. Mm. And I, I'm... I'm going to guarantee one thing. There'll be calls for Ben Stokes to take over this side. Stokes, who wasn't available tonight, we haven't mentioned that he was um, not quite right to play yet in this game. Mm. But um, I'm certain that there'll be certain uh, sections of maybe the media or other um, others in pundit land who, who want Stokes to take over this side for you know all the reasons that we've seen in, in Test cricket and the sort of magic dust that he provides. I think that'd be a, a, a reckless decision to change up what they've had going mm-hmm. for the last 13, 14 months. Uh, under Butler and and Matthew Mott but still you you can guarantee it's coming I I think tonight felt less like you know this was a team that can't do it anymore and and more like this was a team that wasn't expecting to be mugged you know we talked about New Zealand in our in our preview episode uh, saying that exactly the same thing will happen as always happens which is that we will underrate New Zealand and then they'll come out and be better than everybody thinks and and that was true Uh, but it was okay they took about 30 off the first three overs that Wokes bowled Um, they took 38 off Mark Wood's first three overs. Uh, yeah. it, Butler's fishing around for options. He brings Mo and Ali in. He gets smacked for six in his first over. Um, brings Rashid in. Uh, he gets belted. It, wherever they turned, it wasn't working. And and I think there was a degree of panic. You know, but yeah, you're professional players and you're used to things going wrong. Um, but but there was they were fumbling for an answer and and couldn't. Uh, provide one and yeah partly it's probably to do with the, the slippery ball and that doesn't help but um, they looked like a side that weren't expecting to be challenged I don't think anybody could have expected that it, it was it was a perfect partnership and like there, there almost wasn't a bad shot there was one that Conway pulls just past mid-wicket where where Curran might have been able to to take a catch on a better day but that was off wood and it was traveling at about 150 mm. kilometers an hour off the bat so I mean that would have been a fluke catch even if he'd been able to pull it off but, but there were no streaky shots played yeah and Rashid had 35 runs taken from his first four that that just wouldn't have happened four years ago right like Rashid was the the guy who put the clamps on mm. in those middle overs coming on as soon as the first power play was complete and so on uh, the other point with the energy around today like uh, Josh Butler reminds me a little bit of Stephen Smith as captain in that he wears all his emotions on his face I know it's much harder when he's keeping under the helmet hot oppressive conditions but you know he was genuinely fuming at different points tonight there was a, a leg before decision he reviewed in hope that was hitting or impact mm-hmm. was about six inches outside the line of the off stump. So it was never going to be out, but you could see he did it almost out of frustration. Um, there was four buys, the ball after Ravindra reached his hundred. And I'm not saying Butler didn't try and grasp it, but as it went past him, he was yeah. so dismissive and you know, th- that's going to be a challenge for Butler, keeping it together on nights where it doesn't click. And obviously tonight was one of those. Well, I mean, nothing, nothing clicked. The only thing clicking was the, Ball off the middle of the bat. I'm I'm still a bit shell shocked just just having watched it. It was so perfect and and like the yeah. the audacity of this kid, he's 23, just to come out in his first World Cup game and absolutely destroy a hundred. I mean Conway scored New Zealand's fastest World Cup hundred off 83 balls and then held that record for about 20 minutes because Ravindra then <laughs> got his off 82 balls. <laughs> like like yeah. how do you come up with this? Um, and how do you bat so well together? The the chemistry was perfect. The endurance like we've seen players get really tired after about 20 overs out there Um, these guys got through basically the whole innings and they were struggling and sweating a bit towards the end but they were still middling the ball so uh, it was just a perfect night for New Zealand you know there's there's almost nothing else you can say just go and find the highlights and watch the, the purity of the shots They've effectively got two wins out of this. And I yep. know this is a point we made on the telly already, but because of the bulk net run rate, this happened to them in the T20 World Cup last it year. Happened so in they, 2019. They flogged Australia. It happened they in 2019. They thrashed Sri Lanka in the they, first game. Oh, Sri Lanka. Um, and they, of course they, they had a net run rate of five, positive five after the first game. Right, so two World Cups where they've had this boost. And England are like Australia last year in the T20 World Cup, where they need to kind of make up a game at some point yep. to 
progress to the semi-finals. A long way to go, but just thinking ahead, often these things can come down to net run rate. And New Zealand, we, we said it in the preview as well, that if they got over the line here, they now have uh, Netherlands on Monday, mm-hmm. uh, then Bangladesh, then Afghanistan. They should win all three of those. So, that you know, that could be four and zip with a, a bumper net run rate and have one foot in the semi-final sort of, you know, 12 or 13 days into the group stage. Yeah. By contrast, England have Bangladesh on Tuesday up at Durham Shala, which already feels kind of must win, right? Mm. Like if they lose to New Zealand, then lose to Bangladesh, of course, they'll have the, the higher profile teams to come in India and Australia, other favourites in the tournament, teams like Pakistan, who are always a handful. Um, yeah, without wanting to be too dramatic. I mean, they're, they're going to have to beat Bangladesh in a couple of mm-hmm. days' time. Yeah, it, it absolutely must win. You, you pretty much can't lose the first two um, and, and expect to progress. So uh, I think I think it's time to move to the final word, Hall of Fame. There will be a lot of nominations. It's brought to you, though. Yes, it's the... brought to you by Westfield, Adam. And, and I'm, I've, uh... Westfield, London, and Westfield, Stratford City. That's right. And, and clearly the people at Westfield have been listening to our segments on terrible copy because they have folded that in our observations about the ICC um, copy I think it was they tell us the Cricket World Cup may be the best place to celebrate cricket as a sport that was one of the lines <laughs> out, of, out of one of the press releases recently um, but they say there's no better place to celebrate tomorrow's trends today as a shopping concept than Westfield London this weekend that's beautiful that is some beautiful copywriting work right there yeah, so look laundrette between the 6th and the 8th of October um, to see how the future of fashion is being influenced by style around the world and the changing world around us. Free workshops for all ages and fashion, sustainability and exercise across the weekend and tune in live from 7pm on the 5th of October or watch on demand as Amber Sandu shows you everything happening as part of Westfield Day. So Google Westfield London for all the information you need, Westfield London. Westfield, Stratford City, more extra, less ordinary. Mm. Jeff, Hall of Fame, first time in the World Cup. Exciting. Uh, there, there are so many Hall of Fame moments um, for this. I, I, I enjoyed, even before the game started, when we did the preview show, I said, well, Lockie Ferguson is in the squad, but how many games is he going to play? About three um, in between being injured. First thing at the toss, Lockie Ferguson's got a bit of a niggle, so he'll be sitting out today. They haven't even played yet. Um, yeah, and, and then, like you say, New Zealand having, well, Southie Williamson also injured, so going in with 12 to pick from. Um, yeah, was was uh, was it, it? It seemed to fit the brand. I loved the the cricket ground DJ uh, giving uh, OMC how bizarre mm-hmm. a run uh, that great New Zealand one hit wonder. Um, I, I spent some time on their Wikipedia page today, Jeff, mm-hmm. um, which won't surprise you. They were known as the Otara Millionaires Club, and that was a, a piss take because Otara was a poor suburb of Auckland, right. so you know. Altara uh, Millionaires Club. But sadly, um, both Phil and Paulie from that band and that film clip you probably remember mm-hmm. from 96, they both died. Um, so um, uh, RIP to OMC. But um, yeah, that was my... The first thing I noticed this morning when flicking on the coverage was um, good decision there. And the second thing I noticed was that there was nobody there. Now, of course, the crowd padded out as the evening went on, but it was a dreadful look. There's mm-hmm. no avoiding the fact that when you have the national anthems for game one of a World Cup and there is nobody in the stadium, there might have been a handful of thousand people out of a capacity of somewhere between 100 and 130,000, depending on who you wish to believe about the capacity there at Umdabad. Mm. That just looks rubbish. And, you know, there were clips of 96. The first game of the 96 World Cup at the old Umdabad was also played between England and New Zealand. And it was chock-a-block. And I know there are challenges with tickets where people, I'm reading reports on Twitter, having to go to the venue to collect their ticket, not on game day. So there's an extra security hurdle to clear there. Yep. I know it's hard to get into the grounds. I know it was hot in the afternoon. I know it's a work day. I know it started at 2 p.m. All of that taken into consideration still looks rubbish. Mm. Um, that they, they should have scheduled either India to play the first game, although I know it's in India's interest to play a little bit later. We know that India got the dream run in 2019 by um, playing their first game a week into the tournament or something like that. And they presumably want to have a similar setup this time. Um, but it should have been India, the hosts in game one at Ahmedabad, or England should have been playing New Zealand at a much smaller venue. Mm. You can't have both at the same time. Otherwise, you, you compare it to any other World Cup in any other sport, it looks ridiculous. I'm throwing in a, a Hall of Fame for, I can't remember who it was on the comms, but at, um, at, at 23 minutes past the hour where I was, uh, seven minutes from the start of play, you just get the feeling it's about to start was the line. You did. You did get that feeling. That was a feeling you got. Um, I liked Sam Curran uh, driving the ball past mid-on and um, 
being creating his own fake fielding. So you can be done for fake fielding, but Midon dives to save the ball, misses it. Um, it gets passed, but Curran thinks that it's been saved and doesn't take the single that's comfortably on uh, as the fielder comes in from the deep. That was quite good. And then also when he nicked the ball, Curran, he just stood there and looked guilty. And Damasena gave him like... 10 seconds to walk. He was like, come on, you know you've hit it. Go on, walk. And then eventually he's like, fine, I'll pop the finger up. Get out of here. Um, it was it was a very long period of time. Last thing I liked was um, Sachin Tendulkar was on the TV coverage, Jeff. I'm sure you, mm-hmm. you saw this. Now, the golden rule with TV, uh, as we both know, is that when you're in a commercial, the 30-second ad at the end, you can talk as much as you want, but you have to shut up when everyone comes back so they can align the broadcast. So even if you're midway through a sentence, pause, <coughs> And continue mm-hmm. your sentence if that's what you wish to do. But no one tells Sachin what to do. He was halfway through a sentence about how he liked to use the buckled leather pads and not the Velcro. And he spent about 10 minutes discussing that on broadcast. Crashed straight into the new over because you can do what you want with your Sachin Tendulkar. Very good. Um, yeah, Ben Stokes milling around at the break without the substitute's vest on. Um, oh, just yeah. just <laughs> captaining the side by proxy. That was quite well, good. Well, much as it is with Sachin, if you're Ben Stokes, you don't have to wear the mm-hmm. Velcro you vest. Wear the vest. Know, um, Doesn't look good. Uh, yeah. I, I, you can, you, I, I know I touched on it in the main part of the show, but how many minutes until the first headline goes up from a pun that's saying Stokes must catch Stokes must. Reckon? Stokes like, must catch It'll be within an hour, right? Um, and, and the last one for me, I, I don't know if anybody picked up on this, but um, had they hit the last ball of the innings for six when they needed one to win, had they scored a six instead, uh, Conway and Ravindra would have had New Zealand's highest ever ODI partnership. They ended up falling oh. three or four runs short of what McCullum and, and James Marshall put together some years ago. Um, so they, they have the, the second highest in the bag, but they could have gone top of the pops if, if, if somebody, if, the, if only the runner had come out with that urgent information. As we wrap up the show, uh, I'll note that tomorrow is Pakistan up against the Netherlands at Hyderabad. Um, that's it, Jeff. Uh, this has been the first episode of the World Cup Daily. There's going to be 50 of them all up. They're all going to be brought to you uh, by Westfield London and Westfield mm-hmm. Stratford City. Google them. Uh, their, their link is in the show notes as well. More extra, less ordinary. Thank you to them for their support in what we're embarking upon. Uh, and Jeff, um, uh, we'll, we'll do it all again around this time tomorrow. I think, in fact, I'll have Cam Ponsonby mm-hmm. with me tomorrow. We'll be recording from somewhere in central London. All the fun of the fair. New Zealand thumping victors by nine wickets with a million balls to spare. It's a boil over. It's a boil over in Ahmedabad. See you next time.